logical standpoint. Okay. Yep. Uh, little red lights on. Uh, go ahead and call the meeting to order. Thank you, everyone, for coming this evening. First item on the agenda is review and approval of the minutes from the prior meeting. If anybody has any additional thoughts or changes or additions, uh, <coughs> please share them. Otherwise, I would look for a motion to approve, please. I'll move to approve as written. I'll second. Motion to approve. We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Compare the minutes. Witzel? Property discussion. All right. If I'm we'll an dive right in. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, including your package, you've got a number of uh, sheets and views of this uh, development, which I referenced at our last planning commission meeting. And we do have a representative from WHKS who will be here to, to maybe talk a little bit about it too. But uh, I just wanted to pull your attention to page seven of your packet. You can see kind of an overhead shot view where it shows this is a sort of a rural style development, which is not dissimilar to the little subdivision, which is in the north side as well. Off of uh, off of 16th Street, there um, number of issues we're working through with them, you know, grades and things like that. And uh, but um, staff has done a preliminary review. So Brad, I don't know if you wanted to just talk about a little bit, or if we want to have Jack jump in here. Um, sure. Why don't I start and just kind of walk through uh, some of the entitlement steps to this, because there's a lot of steps that they have to go through. So it's good that we're kind of talking about this at a preliminary level. This property is located. Um, if you if you look at your map up there on the kind of the, the northeast corner uh, of the site, if you will, I don't think you can see my little hand because there's a delay. But the location where it's at, uh, when we went through the comprehensive plan process, we didn't envision uh, development happening here. We're always looking at a crystal ball and doing the best we can to anticipate where growth is going to occur. So the first thing that needs to happen as part of this is we do need to amend the comprehensive plan to reguide it from that um, urban reserve, if you will, to uh, single family residential. And so it'll go to a light yellow color. The other thing we have to do is we have to look at the text in the comp plan. The proposal that they have right now is for large lots, essentially a one acre, one unit per acre density. And if you look at the text uh, in, in the comprehensive plan, when we talk about uh, urban development with sewer and water services and, and urban streets, we generally are looking at a, a little higher density. And so right now, the way our comprehensive plan is written, it says two to, two to four unit per acre for that low density category. Um, Mr. Bigelow, in his uh, uh, proposal here, has put a letter together that talks about why he's exploring that, that larger lot pattern. And the reality is that larger lot pattern is in demand in the community. Uh, it's in demand in many communities. Um, and it also happens to, to be in a location where when we look at the natural resources in that area, and I don't know how fast this screen will switch over for you, but when we look at the natural resources in this area, um, you can see as I zoom in, the parcel sits right here. You've got uh, a fair amount of natural resources that form kind of the western edge. You've got a couple of large lot single family residential homes in the northwestern corner and an existing large lot pattern to the north. So it does provide what I would consider kind of a good transition to an adjacent development pattern. Typically we wouldn't, from a planning perspective, we wouldn't be real um, favorable of a, a one unit per acre density with sewer and water services. The Problem isn't today, the problem is 25 years, 30 years down the road when all of a sudden you have to redo the infrastructure there. And the reality is the cost to, to redo the infrastructure is the same if you have 37 lots or if you have 50 lots. It's just spread over those lots differently. So when it's spread over a smaller number of lots and it's not an anticipated cost, we run into all kinds of problems. And then that, that the problem is no one wants to pay for those costs by themselves. And that's, that's where we get into the whole question of, you know, is it a sustainable development pattern? They are proposing in their concept a rural street pattern, so it reduces the costs, if you will, similar to the subdivision to the west, uh, the rural lots to the west. Um, and again, it does meet, as we've mentioned, kind of a, a, a non-existent market uh, in the area here of one acre lots. So that's what they're proposing. They do need uh, an annexation as part of this because currently they're not in the city. The annexation uh, is okay. They do happen to be adjacent to right of way that was annexed for 16th Street. So that's uh, a logical annexation and they are in the order of the annexation area. At the same time they do that, they will also need a rezoning from uh, uh, currently not in the city to uh, to an R1 district. And then, of course, they'll need the preliminary plat. 
the concept that you see in the in the packet which is here essentially comes with the driveway uh, where I think there's an existing field entrance uh, off the 16th brings one street in a cul-de-sac goes up to the left which which is fine to end in a cul-de-sac it's kind of a long cul-de-sac but it really there's not going to be continuity to the north there because of the natural features and the drain in the ditch that's here um, and residential development to the north then it comes to the east and extends north it does end in a cul-de-sac here and uh, to the north of there are there's there's some rural residential lots possibly you could see a street connection through there um, but I think it's not unlikely that a cul-de-sac wouldn't work okay we did request I think the concept that's in your packet did not include this street to the east we did request that there be a street stub to connect to the east so that when this development happens to the east there is some connection there mm. uh, to have alternative ways in and out of that neighborhood um, and then minimize kind of the number of accesses onto 16th street so this is just the concept coming down the, the pipeline to you there is uh, another component to this that's a trail connection the DNR has a concept and I know we talked about it in the comprehensive plan um, a little bit this was done in 2015 that showed this idea of a, a, a trail connection kind of on the back 40 of these lots this is the subject parcel right here and so they show an idea coming along the natural resource area uh, an idea that is very difficult if not impractical both from a political acceptance there's a couple of rural residential lots in there that would have to be um, impact that would be impacted and then there's some very challenges topography it's it's there because they want to have a trail close to natural resources um, but the buildability of that is I think raises a question and the long you know when would that be built is really a, a hard to know we do have the ability to extend an existing trail that you see here and the applicant has proposed uh, actually extending it from its current terminus which is not on their property so they're looking at filling about an 800 foot gap and then extending that trail on 16th Street so that it extends past their driveway so that would make a good trail connection on 16th Street we have right away there for it and it connects to an existing trail already the future of this alignment here uh, that the DNR and, and the whatnot I think it's just the DNR has looked at you know can still move through other areas to the east it's just this idea becomes much more difficult if we approve a plat that we've got uh, moving forward today it's already difficult again because of the buildability of it so those are the key points that I would raise there's uh, several steps that they have to, to get into starting with the annexation which does again have to be approved by the town board and the City Council and uh, we have a representative here from uh, WHKS if you have questions they can answer those this one would come down the pipe probably next month How do they uh, determine the lot the lot width from uh, um, are they trying to hit one acre or if we're looking to get more houses into a certain area do you look at something that's not as wide and not every lot becomes that acre parcel or you know yeah right now this is just totally driven by what the applicant yeah is trying to do in the market they're trying to meet yep. and uh, it's I you think should have gotten that letter emailed off to you too that yeah I saw yeah yeah yeah, out. yeah. yeah. So, I guess I'm just coming from a city standpoint mm -hmm. where you know if we're looking to say tap into our sewer we need more housing and I'm not yep. opposed to the way this development is yep. but you know is there is there a re you know we from do a not development have standpoint is there a reason that lot widths are 200 feet wide instead of all 100 foot wide so yeah the, it's purely market driven here we yeah. do not have a maximum lot width we have minimum lot width right right we do not have a maximum lot width um, most many cities don't although some of the emerging trends if you will of, of the urban areas are to put a maximum density and a maximum lot width because they want to get smaller lots right, and they right. encourage density but here we do not how wide are the lots at Littles on average at where Littles, Littles. what's Littles that, that would be just to the, the west to the, the development to the west just on the other yeah. side of the yeah, sewer plant that horseshoe shape yep I, I bet you those are pushing um, I think my lot is probably 300 feet across at the street level but in the back it's probably 80 
it varies, right. Because right. Of so it isn't really any different than Little's. Uh, they're a little smaller. They're a lot smaller. smaller. Mine's about two acres. Yeah. Yeah, I would say Little's. Yeah. So they're smaller. Two hundred is a pretty average, I'd say, over there. Yep. Like. And you can see that. Yeah, I would say two hundred feet is probably a, a pretty good number as a kind of an average lot depth or dimension width uh, of Little's. And what they're proposing. Uh, I guess I don't know what what's the lot. Do you know what the lot depth or width is? Yeah, it is much less on on this. These are more like one acre lots versus Littles is two and a half to three acre lots. So, is it possible that you know I don't want to put a binder on anything, but it seems like every time we build or a log building, it's future access or extension or something. I like the idea of the Stub Street going to the east to connect to future, but is it possible that there may be a need for some kind of street to the north? Mm. And that is a conversation that we talked about a little bit. I know that we talked about it with the, uh, you know, and, and there is that road that goes in the township there and you can see where it would potentially hook in it. They'd have to cut a lot out, but uh, I know I had a meeting with the county engineer today and he mentioned that as well. So, yeah, I so think does that tie into Stonebrook, is it? Um, County Road 15, right? Yeah, it's where Helverson live, and Lucky Lurkin is right on the corner. Okay, okay. That, yep. I think that's the street that connects. Okay. So this would come but down. But you're traveling a lot more, <clears throat> from a development standpoint, you're traveling a lot more people through there if they didn't come out this way. Yeah. But I was I think, and I think if you're, you know, if they, <coughs> I don't I think they can really get access the other way. Then. I was just thinking... Or if we someday annex on to the north, sewer and water, you know, coming south. What what I understood when I talked with Tony on this is everything will be grinder pumps that'll pump up to 16th Street, so there won't right. be, you know. So. But someday it might get tied in. Well, how far into the, how far into the future do you go? <laughs> well, I know, but it always seems the like. The engineer says 40 years. He's still complaining about you know the Casson Parkway that didn't happen. Mm. That was what we talked about today, and right. okay. he's looking for those north-south connections. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So there's one that's going to come out, you know, that we've referenced before in the northeast part of potentially Casson Meadows. Yeah. And this is another one. He said, "Well, what are you, you going to do with that?" You know, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. It's how yeah. far do you look out? Right. But it, it could happen. You yeah. know, it, it, but we need to have something. Right. One of these has to go through. Something like this is needed. I mean, like I said before, when they talk about affordable housing or housing availability, it isn't just low income. There are people I know that would buy into this thing and become part of the city. And if I, I know it's not ideal to have large lots, but there are people that look for that. And we need diversity in this town, not just the small lot, but we need stuff like this too. Yeah, that that is the road to come to Lucky Lurk and it is and okay. Yep. And that that's probably less than a township road that goes out that way. Probably, <laughs> it is. <laughs> I'm I'm just looking down the road. Someday, it's going to happen. Is, are those two areas that say pond areas? Are those potential ponds or just? I don't know the answer to that. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. Are. There's actually so there's three proposed pond locations. Um, so on the shorter call, there's a call to that. I guess we get the one on the west side of the, of the development. Um, if you go way to the north, you go on the west side of the, of the call to that. Be three lots to the south. Be one, be one pond. And then I guess um, if you're looking at that same call to that, and you look on the east side of it. Yeah. Basically, between the, the two back lots, there that will be the larger ponds. So most of the stormwater treatment will take place there. And the third location will be at the end of the easterly long call to stack, way on the north end of the other one. And, and, and that's right down by a road that we're talking about. So. And there is, there is a split between two properties there, so it, it could be designed for a road there. I just know how the ponds work because there was supposed to be a pond in Littles that became a lot. Yeah. 
Well, we can take that input into advice in, into advisement and start looking at that and see if there isn't something we can do there. Okay. So, so where does the city come back and say, you know, hey, we'd want more lots or, or we don't want more lots or where, where does that come into play in, yeah. in, this, in these discussions? So uh, the, the first thing that has to happen is we need to amend the comprehensive plan. Um, you could make a case that what they're proposing here does not fit within our current comprehensive plan. The most discretion you have as a city is with the comprehensive plan, that high-level policy document. And so it could come into play there. Um, the second place would be when we get into approval of the preliminary plat mm -hmm. and their platting pattern doesn't fit with the comprehensive plan. So um, we have that kind of avenue if we want to try to get more lots. Um, you know, we did talk about that with them a little bit. They're really responding to the marketplace, as kind of Lonnie pointed out. Uh, and if, if the city feels like we need to get more density out of it, that becomes a policy position that we start with that comp plan amendment. If they don't get a comp plan amendment, then I think the challenge of approving this would be approving something inconsistent with the comp plan, which I would advise against. But our comp plan has, doesn't have it as residential area at the moment. It's a holding, Correct. holding area. Which Correct. So we would need to amend the comp plan to bring it in, and either we create a new land use designation right. for this, or we modify the existing R1 to go down to a, a density that this would fit into. And so that's what we'll have to do when they come forward with an application, is we'll have to talk about you know what's the best comp plan amendment that we do. Well, would you suggest adding a designation or altering R1? Um, I, I think I would suggest altering R1, but I, I got to look at it a little closer. Um, we could add a designation that's more suitable to properties that are in that transition area abutting up against rural residential areas. Um, in other communities, we've just created a, a, an, a density a land use category with a pretty broad range, and then we've had policies that say when you are abutting existing rural residential or natural resource areas, you need to take that into consideration and design according to that which gives us flexibility to look at a number of different alternatives, whether it's smaller lots in open space or larger lots with bigger backyards or whatever. So when we do the comp plan amendment, I, that's what we need to work on. I guess where does the city come from from a financial standpoint of saying they want more lots versus they really, it's fine what the developer is putting in? Um, I because think as you said, we're, we're, we're deciding for 25 years in the future what, what, what it's going to cost to redo this. Yeah, and I think that's a, that's a conversation as we move this forward in how we approve the final preliminary and final plat. Uh, is there some kind of resolution statement, whereas finding that gets recorded on documents that makes it very clear that when and if these properties face that reconstruction process, you know, we have a policy, you have larger lots, buyer beware kind right. of deal. Yeah. And uh, I know we've talked a lot about that in other communities I've worked in. To my knowledge, no one has ever actually put anything in. But I can tell you, uh, I live in, in a suburban community in the Twin Cities. I have a large lot. I live on a corner lot. And when they came through to do the street reconstruction for the first time, and we got the bids on that, people went berserk. Mm -hmm. And the city went from a 80 20, 80 percent assessed to 20 percent city funds to 50 50 and so I benefited greatly but the people down the road that have small lots didn't <laughs> they basically subsidized my lot so that's the dilemma that you face and you don't face it until you go to reconstruct the streets so what's different here though is you're doing a rural street they're going to propose a rural street segment and you've already got some of those in the city so you got to be comfortable with that so you're reducing the cost so it's not as severe um, but you're still going to have, you know, infrastructure, you know, under the street utility stuff that, that are there, and, and that's still going to be there. So we can do some stuff in the language and in the final plat approval that gets recorded uh, that can provide some of that buyer beware language. I don't have anything else unless you have other questions. Yeah. Uh, I think... Yeah, this is something that is needed in the city because if you, it gives some in the community an opportunity to move up 
and what that does is open up the smaller homes for more young families and things yep. to come in and to start new. So I, I definitely think that there is. Uh, the lots in Littles, once they go on sale, uh, it, they're sold in less than a week. Yep. So, yeah, the demand is there. Um, so I, I am all for moving forward and looking at this. Um, as, and I just I see that the um, the properties just to the west of that are in the city already. I wasn't quite sure if they were or not, but they are. No, they're not. No, they're not. No, they're not. They're not. According to this, I thought that, that yeah, was. It would be in the urban expansion zone, but it's not yeah. in the city. Yeah, um, let's see here. These parcels right here are not in the city limits. Tolleson, MK. So. City cast news. Does the city annex those with them? So it's a block? It wouldn't be required to be to be done. I think uh, at a future point when the sewer becomes an issue, then you probably would look to annex those. You know, you'd be justified within the early annexation agreement and with those state dotted lines look covered on three sides. They wouldn't like have that any real in the city. more of a political decision then and the kind of pushback you have on that than the actual functional aspect of it. Okay. I haven't contemplated it at this time to do that. So okay. So we're. Oh, See, this no, is gray. Uh, so the blue is the Casson yeah. wastewater the plant. Thick, the thick line is the. To the east of that. Oh, 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 okay. So the blue is the yeah, wastewater okay. treatment plant. Yeah, it comes yep. in here, captures oh, the, the street. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. The takeaway I've got is that uh, we've got some things to take back to the developer. Uh, a couple of different things. One is an access route, possibly to the north, to your point, and then the density issue, is something that we can go back and investigate some more. And then the component that you talked about, which is making sure that people are packing some of the possible assessments and reconstruction, which would be substantial. Yeah. You know, hopefully it would, you know, like I said, 20, 25 years in the future, but still something that could be um, a real cost. To me, that's the 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 density question in that, or this Good connected. Yeah. 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 Okay. Good. There's no plan on making this a, uh, what do you call it, uh, what's the term I'm looking for, where they're all part of a community? No association. No association. No association, no association anticipated, no. Okay. Not we have talked to him a little bit about uh, providing some basic facilities, especially right at the, the front of the subdivision, yep. where we might have like a bus stop almost for the children so that they would be able to yep. you know, stand there. Otherwise, it's kind of, a, uh, you know, it's a lot for them. Building, walking up and down this, you know, yeah. so concerned for the school access there. Because Littles is was developed based on an association, sure. which has never come to bear. But now Littles is city sewer and water, so where this this would is grinder pumps. This would be city. It's still, city still be suit. Okay. It's okay. Still okay. Sewer, yeah. It's a low flow kind of a thing. Okay. Still would count. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it would have city sewer and water. Okay, I'm fine. Okay. And the, the road to the north isn't critical. I just want you to understand that. I just, I think future-wise, it's the only reason I was looking. Yeah, yeah totally understand. <coughs> Is that crossing a river somewhere, that road to the north? Or not really? Nope, the river. No, that no, goes down by the Because the river okay. bends. Okay. Okay, so I think we're good on that. I'm good. I'm good. It's just information. So. Good discussion, though. We seem to do that well at times. <laughs> <laughs> Being somewhat sincere. We're good. Next item on the agenda, public hearing, smiling moose, conditional use permit for a drive through business. Well, you've got to include your packet, and of course, uh, the, the board's all very familiar with this project. Uh, you've got a good background uh, right up from, uh, from Brad there, and we've discussed it at a couple of meetings now. We have had a pretty accelerated process, um, and I know there's been some questions about that, but uh, including your packet, you have information related to the, uh, the zoning. We did 
rezone it, or not rezone it, but reformulate the code to apply more directly for the situation that exists. Um, I think we've had a lot of the questions that uh, have been you know, thought through to the best of our ability. We can't plan for every eventuality, but uh, I don't know if there's any questions on that. We have hit the uh, required deadlines for all of our postings and things like that. So uh, I personally have not received a lot of feedback aside from the chamber, which had some just uh, supportive comments, which I appreciate, and uh, it felt that it was, it was valuable to have that uh, not that. So. Ms. White, before I open up the public hearing, did you have anything you'd like to share? Okay. Uh, with that said, I'll go ahead and open up the public hearing. If anybody has anything they would like to share, if they'd be kind enough to come up to the podium and uh, start off with your name and address, please. If not, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. I thought the write-up was amazing. I, I, I respect your comments about you can't plan for everything. Right. Uh, but I think it's a very solid reuse for that building. I guess I've, I've read through it a few times trying to find some issue, some challenge, some fault, and I, mm -hmm. I, I struggle to see anything. So. Yeah, the, the biggest concern from a staff level, and what well, Linda and I have talked about this, is the, the possibility of uh, pedestrian interaction with the traffic flow. Well, if you look at page 18 in your packets, you've kind of got the overhead shot there, and we did have some questions about that. The other question was the backup turn radius into the traffic lane. So yeah. those are the, the two that I know we, we discussed, and Brad, I'm sure you've got other things you want to throw in there too, but those were the concerns we had. Not insurmountable, of course, but yeah. just ones that we wanted to be very cognizant of. Sure. Yeah, and, and if I could just throw a few comments in here to, to kind of set the stage for this. First, from a, a planner perspective, you know, we always have to look at this in two ways. One, is this a, a use that works for the site? And my quick answer to that is no, it doesn't work well for the site. Is this a use that's good for downtown? And my quick answer to that is yeah, it's a use that would be great for downtown. And so the challenge is how do we make it work? Um, they've done a lot to try to figure out how to make this work in that site, how to make it be successful. And uh, the biggest concern I have with this um, is success is where it creates problems. <laughs> and the biggest problem in my mind is if they are successful and traffic begins to back up onto West Main Street, then we have a safety issue. Uh, and if Joe's <coughs> still on the line, you know, he can attest to that if they need to get through and all of a sudden there's vehicles, you know, when people want their coffee, they're going to sit in that line and they're going to wait to get their coffee. So uh, the thing I want to emphasize is we've, we've done a conditional use permit here. We worked with them. They created some creative ideas. A, a good example is, you know, we said you got to close off the access to Fifth Avenue. You can't have an access there if you've got cars stacked up and people trying to get in. And the response to that, I think, which was a good response, was, well, you know, if, if over time we decide this doesn't work and we want to sell it, they may want to reopen that access. We also have a use that's open from, you know, the drive-through use isn't necessarily going to be open all the time, and when it's not open, we want to be able to have that access there. And so the solution, which I think is creative and good, is, is to create a series of planter boxes that are on casters that when the drive-through is in operation, it's there, and when it's not, they can move those around. And that's when they created this little patio outdoor seating area, which I think is a great use, again, for the site. But to uh, the, the concerns uh, Tim brought up, you know, you do have an issue where people are going to be crossing through parked cars and cars in the driveway uh, of the, of the drive-through to get through to that patio area. So there are certainly some challenges. Um, they do have a striped crossing there where people could get in a, a designated uh, uh, pedestrian path up to the sidewalk on Main Street and then over to the patio area. We also have to make sure we're aware of that patio area and site triangles, which you see the line in there that represents that site triangle. You know, as long as things are less than 30 inches in height, uh, if it is something where all of a sudden we see there are problems, we have a CUP that we can enforce so that they can correct those problems. Um, in the staff report, you know, we do talk about the the worst case that could happen is they're super successful and cars back up into Main Street and we have a traffic problem that's unacceptable traffic problem. So what's that mean? Well, we say you got to fix it. And so what are the possible solutions? Well, we could look at West Main Street and we could create a turn lane into the site. We lose parking. That's probably not going to be acceptable because parking is tight in downtown. Maybe there's a way to recreate parking. 
those become very costly and probably impractical. But the other option is you shut down the drive through And the conditional use permit you know, gives us the possibility if we have major problems to do that. So that's the one thing I just want to make sure everybody's crystal clear that if we have problems, this could end up being a situation where the conditional use permit can be revoked. And that's the, the only, I think they've done a good job of creating a, a site design to try to mitigate those impacts already. Uh, and if we have other problems, then it, then it becomes the least desirable uh, effect of having to actually shut it down. So traffic is the biggest thing in, in my mind that, that has the potential uh, to be an issue here. They've, other things have been addressed. Those are the only things I really wanted to comment on. So the conditions laid out are more about enforcement. They've done most uh, of the site design and, and design matters to address the conditions. The access to the south, we do have an agreement in place that they provided us. That wasn't there before, so that's a good thing. Now we know we have an agreement in place to handle uh, ingress and egress across that site that's permanent. So um, with that, I guess I would just pause and see if there's any questions people have. A couple of questions and maybe they can be clarified. Uh, <coughs> um, planters on casters from an operation sounds like it could get kind of interesting and, and why not just, you know, if this is going to be a drive through, just close off the Fifth Avenue access because you don't want tr cars trying to pull into there. The office building I'm at, they've chained off the, the access between two parking lots and for two years, people still drive in and can't figure out how do I get around, what do I do? Um, and so if those were permanent, um, you know, but close, closing it off allows for a lot more landscaping and nicer area. You can maybe even move some of the patio stuff down closer out of, out of the corner. Um, you know, I'm counting about seven cars of, of backup here. Um, and so that definitely does become a concern. Um, and I guess I'm just, um, you know, people who are on Main Street and using the clinic in those different areas, um, th that is a very large potential. And as long as it's a CUP, that can be revoked fairly, fairly easily. Um, but I don't see how car number five and car number four are able to really back up real well. So, you know, if we don't have a permanent curb or something in place there, I think you've got a lot of potential for confusion. Um, so I'm just wondering if, that, if, if there's going to be some permanent curbing there. Otherwise, I just, you know, coming from design and construction, people are just going to pull into the kind of into the two-way and then you're going to get people, how do I get into the drive-through? Um, this isn't any different than the McDonald's in Byron. You go through the drive throughs and there's still a drive up yeah. along the building. Yep. Um, and then the only other aspect is, is there enough backup for the parking that's coming from that building to the right? Because I think that the park, the, the backup parking for that is on this lot for any of those cars to back up and or get access to that trash. So. I mean, I understand the building very, very well. Um, I, I think they've done a, a, the best job that they possibly could, and I'm not, not saying not to move forward, but I just see a lot of uh, red flags that uh, um, make sure that, uh, you know, owner, I'm sure, is aware of, aware of them, but, um, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that we're making a good recommendation, and if that's the case, so. I apologize for interrupting yeah. you. I'm sorry. Um, the one issue that I see, or the thing that I want to bring up, you had mentioned the fire department having access if traffic backs up. I think our future roundabout at Maine and 57 will be more of an issue for the fire department than this will be. I'm, I'm more concerned just if, if uh, traffic backs up into West Main Street. And I, I get it. Yeah. I get it. But I, I seriously think the roundabout at Maine and 57 will be more of an issue for the fire department than this will be. And I've, I've got one point. Instead of <clears throat> cutting that off, would it be better if 
if we were to, because that building, the mail building, that's, we don't want to block those guys off either. Right. But maybe an in and an out <coughs> and using that as a exit and, a, you know, do not enter coming in that way. Because I think, is that what the problem seems to be? You don't, you're not for sure that if traffic coming off of 5th is going to try and enter that too, so at least you have a flow, because I think that's going to be more critical than closing that off, and then the, the only place you're going to be able to get in and out is right on to Main Street, which, you know, I've, I've been in that place several times when it was a pharmacy. You know, you use both exits, entrance and exits, but if you were to have a flow, instead of closing one off and forcing that all back on the main street, creating a bottleneck there, at least you have some way to get out or keep the traffic moving. Because the more you bottleneck, you, you put everybody into that, the only other way they're going to be able to get is through the drive through I don't think this place is, and you can answer this, is <clears throat> you're also going to have stuff inside, correct? Right. So a drive through in reality is perfect if you keep everybody going that way but if you're also going to put into the mix that people could out of their cars to come in I think <clears throat> in my opinion I would you know you could do an entrance and you could do an exit you know if there were ever something that got bottlenecked up in there at least somebody would have a way to get out of that even though you know hopefully everybody can read a sign you know you don't or about 95 percent on that <laughs> maybe 80 but at least that may help in I think that's my opinion on it is, is there any opportunity for stacking on this uh, adjacent property to the south I was wondering about that too you know it, well, what the, if the drive the, the way the drive-through window is oriented the movement is to the south yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. and so stacking. and there's a back once, door right once you get you know, through the window, it, it's not the, the, the stacking issue. Really, is where the menu board is on the north. Uh, and so they're going to stop an order. I probably used the wrong term, but I'm I'm thinking that they're going to be able to see the volume that they have stacked, waiting to get in line, where they encourage them, much like McDonald's oh, right. does, yes. to pull yes. further ahead yes. and stack beyond the building, and then they can carry things out. I'm hoping that they're True. that successful. Yeah. So yeah, I agree. And so w one of the mitigation things we talked about yep. internally at our office was if they were super successful, yep. you've got room here to get around. You, you don't on the top side, on the on the west main side. Yep. But if you if you were to uh, allow vehicles to move through and come on the bypass lane, if you happen to have a rush, yep. You know, do you have the place where they pull up to the microphone. Please pull ahead. We'll come out and get your order. You know, but someone has to monitor that, and it just gets tricky. Yeah. The point being, there are mitigation things they can do. And so, if we get into this operation, and if we find there becomes a problem, then we have to act. And the action is, we need to mitigate by creating a solution to it. And the conditional use permit is written to that effect. So you don't have to go back and amend the conditional use permit. You simply have to mitigate the issue of traffic congestion. That may mean you got to make improvements to West Main Street. It may mean you got to do something else with the access points. It may mean you got to create more stacking distance somewhere. And you know they could do more with the parking lot because they don't need those parking spaces in front. Um, the downtown doesn't require parking, but at the same time, uh, you know if we all of a sudden have parking issues. <laughs> They, they still have a business there. So there are things they could do. It might be take a lot of creativity and cost. And if they are successful, maybe they do have the ability then to absorb some of those costs. Yeah. I think there's about two more spots they could naturally have that would be able to pull south before they would start to turn out. So my, my um, point is they, they have options there to mitigate if there's a problem. And... Uh, Hopefully, if, if something, if, if they are super successful and we do have a traffic issue, we can figure a solution out. I wanted to come back to Sheldon's point because right now the way this is, is designed is you have in and out traffic coming off of Main Street, and that is the in and out traffic for in for the drive through and in for 
people to come park and in for the adjacent building next door. Right, correct. And then everybody needs to go out there. So the concern that, that, uh, that I now see is that do you have enough room for three lanes of traffic coming in off of Main Street? One for the drive through one for people who want to come in and come to work at the adjacent building, and then ultimately if somebody needs to leave. Otherwise, you're going to, you know, what happens if you got two cars that are trying to get in and out of one single spot, and, and now you've got, you know, well, I'm not going to back up into a parking spot, but I can't back up because I'm on Main Street, and, and you, you've got some potential yeah. I issues there, and um, I... So you have a pretty wide curb cut? You know, yeah. so we could possibly it's do some striping there to try to. Yeah, if you could make at least three lanes, three lanes in. yeah, two in and one out, then you're at least going to cover the majority that of that. And, yep. and, and, you know, I think that it's been a, it's a really good solution. Um, uh, yeah, messy. But any successful, if this is a successful business, the last thing we want to do is come in and say, You've got 30 days to get this issue resolved. Otherwise, you've got to be shut down, because you know, you know, from that standpoint, and and kind of um, making sure that we're taking care of it. And uh, oh, that that we can look at seeing if we can't do some striping on the the driveway yeah. entrance to that, and see if there's not a, a better design. Looks like there's enough width there for possibly for three lanes. You know why that oh, is, so. Col do you, Colin? Do you know why that is or not? Okay. I mean, as long as the owner wants to deal with all of these conditions, I, you know, I definitely don't have a problem. Um, it's just customers come and say, well, why did the city allow that to happen? And <laughs> so, so if it gets backed up where you're starting to block traffic on West Main Street, it's free coffee until you get them cleared. <laughs> That opens the floodgates that everybody will be coming there. Be very popular. <laughs> <laughs> Could I add just something real quick? Mm -hmm. Yeah. To help mitigate that, the store is going to be open from 6 a.m. on also. So people are able to park in front of the building and walk in and get their coffee if the line looks like it's too long. And the other third option we thought about that we would like to implement would be to order your coffee ahead of time on an app. And that way, there again, you could just run in and get it or come around the back and we'll hand it to you. So we are trying to look at every single option that we can in order to be careful with that West Main Street. And there again, the busy times for the coffee shop, we think will be 6, 7 a.m. and hopefully on West Main Street. I don't know for sure because I haven't started it yet, but we're hoping that the time frames of the coffee shop busyness hopefully won't be worth the majority of the traffic on Main Street either. But there again, that's a hopeful comment because I don't know since we're not open yet. Last time I drove by the clinic at 7:30 in the morning, every parking lot, every parking spot was taken up there, so I mean, I know there's definitely... 7 a.m., it's pretty easy up there. Yeah, yeah, so, which is great for business. It is, there'll be yeah. a lot of people coming across the street yeah. for coffee. And the employees typically park on my street, to be honest. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. Sure. Yeah. 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 yeah, I mean, the, 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 clinic, the clinic has added a ton of parking for people to park down there. But oh, yeah. yeah, no, those are all valid. Uh, but between the clinic and the chiropractor's office. Yeah. Yep. I just noticed that the architect on this was somebody we may know. Yes. Yeah. That's why I was asking him the question. Because uh, okay. maybe he would know. <laughs> so all of those suggestions, I think, are things we can have them do without changing any of the conditions in here, because all these fit within those That's conditions. That's outlined. Can I ask another question? My, my, my thing went dead, so could you share? Um, did you look at putting the parking up against Main Street and wrapping that you know maybe maybe the parking comes in and off of fifth avenue only and you have the drive the drive through lane closer to the building i don't know if that was ever looked at or not i mean i'm just trying to understand that because the drive through 
through window was grandfathered in, we were not allowed to move that at all. So if you access the parking lot from the Fifth Avenue, you would happen to park right there. Nope, nope. I'm having you. I'm having you come in your drive. You're just. You would come down closer to your building and start wrapping it there, and then all of the parking for your building would be up against. Main Street and people that parked in your facility would go in and out of Fifth Street or Fifth Avenue. I don't know. If this. So parking up here. Yeah. P parking on the west, the kind of the west side of the parking lot. So you're basically bringing the order the order spot down and making people, you know, basically like a 15 foot radius corner so the window is still the two windows are still in the exact same location and I don't know if, if you looked at so, that configuration yeah we, I mean you guys started doing the design work before we changed the zoning code so now that we changed the zoning code we're allowing it with the conditional use permit so you could move the windows you're talking you, like you, this, no, this, you, this yeah you come in this way but here you would come in and, and park and pull out but I don't know where so you would, would move, I don't know where you would move them down. This would still be that two way. Oh. Mr. Chair, I'll, I'll excuse myself from the dais so I can speak to this issue. As the only thing I see you would shorten up your number of cars from I don't, the I don't window, know. from the order point to the window. I don't, I don't think you would because you, you're, you're just lengthening it out in a different location. So, all right. So, when I looked at laying that out, I guess I should. You can get my name. Uh, Colin Tinsley with Armand Architecture Office. It's 11 4th Street Southwest in Rochester. Um, so putting the plans together, we were trying to get the most stacking that was possible on the site. Uh, so looked at, you know, if it came through on 5th, you know, that's a shorter turn that way. If it came in close to the building, that's uh, one, you, you're also having more vehicle pedestrian interactions. If it's if it's driving in front of the building because anybody who's parked out there by Main Street has to cross over to get back to their car. Mm -hmm. So by putting the drive aisle further away from the building, then we try to uh, decrease those vehicle pedestrian interactions and while maintaining the, the maximum amount of stacking possible. So that's also why in the design we've got the two windows because you can order at the, at the, um, first. the first window. Yeah. There's the menu board that can take the order, and so the first window can do the uh, the cash transaction, and then the second window can deliver the order. So that that does speed up the processing through. All the other points. So yep. I'm good. Yeah. I'm good. Anything else? Children's I think it. I think it's good. I. <clears throat> I think we can make this work. You know. I'd like to see it work. Mm -hmm. You know, and for the record, I don't drink coffee either. But I'm not, <laughs> not against anything here either. So. <laughs> I liked you up until the last. Yeah, well. <laughs> Unless there's any more comments, sir, I, gentlemen, I guess I'd look for a motion, please. <clears throat> I'll make a motion that uh, is accepted as as drawn and uh, presented. Okay. I'll second it. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. I assume, sir, you're going to abstain. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Chair, members of the commission, we'll move this on to the city council then uh, on your Wednesday meeting. So we'll put the resolution and stuff together and we'll send it out tomorrow morning. This will go to council on Wednesday, Kim. Okay. Next item this evening, public hearing, pardon me, Casa Meadows 7th Rezone and Preliminary Plat. So this is another project that we've had some discussion on previously, and you've got the report there. I think it's, it's uh, 
sort of highlights the different issues that we've had. This property was uh, subject to, we had an annexation uh, last fall, late last fall, and uh, at that time, originally the uh, developer had not wanted to annex the whole property. We, we advised them and we felt it was more appropriate for him to advise the whole property. So we, uh, he did so, um, and that process went smoothly. Um, now we're looking at uh, basically an uh, extension of utilities and um, you know, this being the next section of his development. Uh, so incorporate two parcels that, um, you know, are, are not currently developed. There are a couple of issues that staff has identified, um, some of the tra tra traffic and transit issues and then pedestrian crossings and things like that. But overall, it's uh, reasonably straightforward. But there are a few issues I think Brad's going to highlight tonight as well. So. Yeah, so why don't I, I'll just start on, uh, on this uh, drawing here, the map on the, the wall. Uh, so this is a request to s subdivide the southerly portion of what you see here uh, and do a preliminary plat for just the southerly portion. The northerly portion would remain uh, unplatted or would be a, an outlot for future development. The big issues with this site when we looked at it was do they even have legal access today? Um, we did some research and the street access to this neighborhood is from 10th Avenue here currently. And that street access, you know, the street is a, uh, a rural section street. It was built more, as, my, as I understand it, as a construction street and never improved to a full city street. There is a city easement that covers 85 feet, uh, the easterly 85 feet of that school district property. It's essentially a right-of-way easement. So we have legal access to it. At first, I didn't know that we did, and so I was looking at this thing. <laughs> we don't even have legal access to the neighborhood. But we did confirm that. So we do have legal access. We do have the ability to uh, improve that street to a city street, and I believe it is in the CIP plans to do that uh, and m make that street uh, more of a city street. So, so access to the neighborhood is there. We also have an access point here at 22nd Street Northeast that's not built. Mm -hmm. but. Um, so this is a little subdivision, as I understand it. Yep. Uh, this street connection uh, is um, not be built through here. If you go up there and look at it, you've got some mature trees in there and, and a trail corridor through there. Um, but a neighborhood of this size and scale really shouldn't just have one access. I would say three, if not more, accesses would be good for a neighborhood of this size, especially as we continue to see it develop. So our conditions of approval suggest in making this access complete here and making an improvement to 10th Avenue uh, and, and making sure that that is a legal access, which we have solidified uh, that with uh, in title search and found out that there is an easement for that. Long term, uh, the, the GDP, if you went through your packet, does show a stub for a street right away here. So originally this was laid out. I'm going to flip to that real quick so you see it. I should close some of these drawings I have of the smiling moose. Um, so when you look at the staff report, there is, where is that at? GDP, there it is. This is the general development. Seven your packets. Thanks, Tim. General development plan, which the it hasn't completely developed exactly according to this, but pretty pretty similar to it, shows um, the northerly street east west stubbing into the property here, which is school district property. It would make sense that long term there be a street connection out to 57 yep. through here, and so we're not addressing that right now because it would be subject to a future plat, and we have a GDP that shows it. And so that would be a long-term plan as this continues to develop. Mm -hmm. Right now, they're just looking at doing a final plat for essentially a line right across here uh, in these pieces to the south. And that's what you see in the preliminary plat drawing here. So the other, the other issue that we were looking at here, and I think it's probably easier to see in the general development plan, to the west we have a school property. And, and you know, certainly the school is talking about different school uses, whether they be athletic facilities or they be other school facilities. Either way, this becomes a long stretch with no connection to that school property. And you have a single family neighborhood where you're going to have a lot of kids 
who aren't going to want to walk all the way up here or all the way down here to get over to the school building and so you're going to have some issues. We're recommending as a condition of approval essentially coming straight across in this east-west street creating a mid-block connection here that's a pedestrian connection. Sidewalk, trail, whatever it may be, we just want to make sure that that's there and when they get to the point of building that infrastructure they grade that lot accordingly so that they don't create walkout lots here and all of a sudden you have a trail that <laughs> is hard to build. So we'll make sure that that gets incorporated into the, the site design and the, the grading plans for that. Um, but beyond that, uh, the, the only other item, one of the things that we're, we're making sure happens, the northerly portion of the plat, right now when you look at the preliminary plat it just shows the southerly portion and so the remaining ports part to the north they would just leave as a meets and bounds. We are going to require that to be an outlot. The benefit of, of it making an outlot is it becomes a non-buildable parcel. So nothing happens on that parcel that would impede the ability to realize the general development plan and thus the street right away needs that we want to talk about in the future. If they just leave it as a meets and bounds, someone could build a house or they could come in and, and uh, the outlot just makes it um, more control from a future subdivision uh, and evolution standpoint. So we are requesting that that be platted as an outlot and essentially be a holding for a future subdivision. Park dedication, um, there's some uh, documentation in the file. There, there was uh, Cass and Meadows Park to the south and there's some improvements that need to happen to that uh, park yet but uh, that park which is located here provides parkland for the neighborhood uh, so we would just take cash in lieu of. Um, and other than that there's a lot of just technical things in the engineers write up that are, are more design related that I don't need to go through in detail. I miss anything, Tim? No, I think that's everything, you know, the, the park plan fees dedication, that's something that seems to have been uh, already paid or already arranged in the previous uh, negotiation. I, I haven't read the details. The late uh, 2000s, but uh, other than that, you know, whack and sack fees will still apply for all of this, so they would as a normal subject. Um, I know from a staff perspective, our perspective, at least when I've had conversations about it, would be to see this whole area um, platted, frankly. You know, doing this, you know, small section and then adding onto it is not something that I'm necessarily in favor of, but of course that is up to the, the planning, you know, commission. It's uh, certainly is a possibility, but um, obviously, um, you know, subdividers want to do this. I don't have any issues with the way it's platted for 7th. I've got a greater issue with the GDP in that northeast corner where they've got a cul-de-sac. Here. Yep. That should continue straight on through and connect with Spring Creek. Spring Creek. Yeah. Yeah. But that is not a part of what they're asking for. The no, it isn't. No. But uh, we have to, when we're considering this, we got to consider yep. future roadways. Mm -hmm. And I think having a cul de sac there when we're just a few hundred feet from connecting with Spring Creek is, is the wrong thing. Just to create, we need to create more entrances and exits from this subdivision so w when you're when you're looking to because this is the second time this has come up about trying to connect from north south how do you connect into something that's a that's partly township and then tying into to, to the city you know when it comes to plowing does the city just stop plowing at their spot and then yeah and you just kind of that's pretty much how it works yep. yeah okay That's how it works for Marty. You just stop. Brad, do you have access to your email? I do, yeah. Because I was thinking I could, st I've drawn some lines on this map. Yes, yeah. At what point this do you become that's a raceway to get, get between different places versus controlled access? I just want to highlight there were some questions included in your packet too from one of the residents in that area, Mr. Uh, Good, Good, what, Dale? Um, and I think we've answered a couple of those already. So he's looking at uh, his questions are regarding the uh, 
the entrance road, which is currently slated to be improved this year. Obviously, that depends a lot on our access from the northeast side. We have to have that 22nd Street access done first, which would be something we would look to negotiate as part of a development agreement because until that's finished, people have a, a release valve. We can't really close down 10. So and that's that's another issue. And then his second question, I think, is related to what uh, what maybe Dwayne's talking about is, uh, you know, maybe I think ideally we'd end up having four. We'd have, you know, two on the southeast and then one to the northeast and one to the west. I don't know if those will happen, but that's kind of the idea. I think what I would suggest is, you know, with, with the subdivision that they're proposing now, it's n it's not as critical that we have the one to the northwest out to 57 and the one to the northeast that Duane just mentioned. For future subdivisions, I would say those things need to come into play a lot stronger. The one to the northeast, um, I would need to look at that a little closer just because of the predominant travel patterns of where people are going. And I don't know that without doing a little bit of traffic analysis. We deal with this a lot. And I'll tell you what, one of the major issues is road connectivity. How do you make it happen, especially when you're up against uh, jurisdictional boundaries and timing of, of development in lots and lots that we don't control. So they're on, on the one that we are talking about, the two lots um, to the north of where that cul-de-sac ended or in another township, you know, do you end up getting into a situation where you had to try to annex those? Is it a forceful annexation? How do you pay for the street? Do you put sewer and water up into there? Do you, you know, so there's all kinds of things that come into play that are really kind of beyond the scope of what we're looking at now, but things we should probably start talking about sooner than later. So, um, and Dwayne may have it all planned out for us. So uh -huh. let's, let's see what he's saying. Get, get the uh, Brad at HKG. And know. is 10th Street being reconstructed by the city, or yeah. is that part of this expansion of this development since that road? being reconstructed by the city. Okay. Anticipated being reconstructed by the city. Okay. It would, I mean, I'm anticipating a cost share on the 22nd Street intersection. We would anticipate that the, I mean, the developer is cognizant of the fact that uh, that's a responsibility that he has, at least in part. So, uh, but yeah, I, mean, I think that 10th Street would be reconstructed part of the city. So how come that's not being a part of the, the development as of, I mean, it was never really constructed well, as a city street yeah, to start with. Yeah, I think with. that, uh, you know, there's, there's a variety of things, different documents from the early 2000s when this was constructed. Okay and responsibilities on different people and promises that were made that weren't necessarily always kept and it's hard for me to go back and mm -hmm. try to enforce some of those things. So I think okay, that's really the best up. answer I have for you. On the seventh. Yeah. I think that's no, uh, yeah. what I'm getting from you, Brad, is that you don't know if it's germane to this discussion to, to plan out that northeast section yet. I don't think it's um, um, necessarily something that we would hold up the approval of this subdivision so long as we have connection on 22nd Street to the east, which seems like a simple one to make, and connection to the south, which is there today. Those two, uh, in my mind, are ones we should, I wouldn't recommend approval of what they're proposing now until those are solidified, essentially. Yeah. The connection out to 57 and the connection north through the township are two that a future subdivision, I would make sure that those are addressed as uh, additional connections. And the one to the northeast, the one to the west, you know, through the school property is an obvious one to me. Uh, and one that would add a ton of benefit because people use 57 probably more so than they would go north through a rural subdivision to County Road 15, but I just don't know County Road 15 traffic as well. It's a golf course, though. It's a golf course. I can imagine. Right up there, you'd be able to <laughs> yeah. just whipping through there. So the other thing that we've looked at, you know, in some of these cases are, are more emergency service stuff. So knock down access points where you could have a, a connection through there. You just don't build a city street. Um, but, you know, those are things that, that we can talk about when we get to that point of that, that um, doing further platting. But to the issue of, you know, 
roads that cross property boundaries and annexation, this piece here, I think it raises a whole new question because if you're going to do rural lots in here, building that street with just those rural lots is going to be really tough. Someone else is going to have to pay for that street. And that's where we're going to run into the biggest issue. Now, if you put sewer and water in there, and all of a sudden you have three times as many lots to spread the cost over, then it becomes much more feasible that the developer will build most of it because they can recapture the cost with the lot itself. But the, that's going to require an exception. Yeah, my point is that we get some sort of concept on a map. Yeah. So we can have those type of discussions yep. in the future. And this particular map isn't so much germane to the Bigelow or to the Lamplin request. That we have now. That we have now. It's more with yep. the Z discussion that's going to be coming up. Yep. Uh, right. Yeah. Yep. I agree. But it, it's, it's worth at least throwing it up there so people have an idea of what I envision, you know, could be. Because ultimately the school is looking to use that as potential school. They're not going to want any roads going through any of it at any point. You know, I mean, and I know it makes logical sense up against the, you know, teeing into that township road, but at that point you you got to have somebody willing to do a development up in that far corner too. And maybe if there's a school there, you can get some development, but the school would already be there. Yeah. So. Well, my understanding of Zed, it's not a public school. Well, it is and it isn't. No, but I'm saying the school, the, the, the school owns all the land around it, and based on the understanding right. is in order for them to put a school there, they need all of that land for green space because they are getting rid of some land to Zed. So. So I've lost track where we at. Have you had yeah. the open the public hearing yet? No, sir, I haven't. Okay. So are there any other questions? Circling back, yeah. Then are we can proceed questions? with that. And Mr. Chair, if I could, maybe if you open the public hearing and do the public hearing, and then after you close the public hearing, maybe we could fast forward to the Z School and talk about that project, and then yeah. come back and take action on the preliminary plat if that sure. maybe helps. With that said, I will go ahead and open up the public hearing, and this is the public hearing for Casson Meadows 7-3 zone and preliminary plat. If anybody has any thoughts they would like to share, if they would be kind enough to come up to the podium, please. If not, I will close the public hearing. So do you want to talk about that or sure. do you want me to? Yeah, hear? I think, uh, and uh, we have uh, some comments there from Brad, which I thought were so succinctly put that I wanted to include them in there. It is coming. It's another annexation, so you should be aware of. Uh, I'm eagerly anticipating their, their petition for annexation. Um, it looks like there's going to be two parcels, a three-acre parcel potentially for the school and another three-acre parcel that needs to be subdivided off from the school's property for a parking area. Um, I know in the conversations that, that I have had, there does seem to be some reticence towards um, allowing for that westerly access to the property that you were talking about, Aaron. Mm -hmm. And um, I, uh, I don't know exactly how we'll end up dealing with that in the phones of time, but uh, I don't know, Brad, you can go ahead and run through your comments if you'd like. Yeah. Um, so this is, uh, it's going to be a K through 12 school, as I understand it. So it is a school. Um, again, we have a, an interesting entitlement track that we have to go through. When we did the comp plan, this was still a, a homestead. And I remember having conversations with them not about not wanting to change that, so we just left it as a single family residential homestead. So uh, from a comp plan standpoint, we would want to re-guide it to uh, public institutional. So that's one thing that has to happen. Uh, and that's just a map change simple. The <coughs> annexation question is a little more challenging. So right now when you look, I'll just use this map to, to kind of show that. With Cass and Meadows 7th, they just completed the final annexation and so they just brought in, whoops, shoot. They just brought in these two parcels. Can you see my hand very well? They brought in those two parcels. That leaves the school district property here and the Z school as the two um, pieces that still need to be annexed. Now the Z school, 
has bought one parcel and they want to buy an additional three acres from the school district. So the um, portion that needs to be annexed, I think, is just the three acre piece, right? Two three acre pieces. Two three acre pieces? Okay. Is it, is it somewhere in my file I have a survey I actually got. I just didn't download that to my system. But um, they're going to buy a small chunk from the school district, so that needs to be split off from the school district's property. So they're going to do some kind of action to split that off and create a new parcel. I talked with them uh, last week, and I think that process is either done or maybe in process. I don't know for sure. They're going to check on that. If it's not, then there w it might be more beneficial to look at a platting process rather than splitting it off and having awkward legal descriptions and meets and bounds. If we do a platting process, then we have the ability to kind of work through some of these issues and possibly work with the school district to get right away platted on the north. So then that question becomes no longer a question. We know we've got right away. The only question becomes when the school district is ready to do improvements, how do we build that street? Or when Cass and Meadows 8th edition comes on, how do we build that street? I think if you talk with the school district, you know, maybe they don't want a street through there, but at the end of the day, as a city, as a municipality, to make this place function properly, safely, and well, we need to look at that. And we have resources to be able to, you know, really require that. We don't want to run a, a street right through the middle of their property, obviously. So pushing it to the north end, I think, could be beneficial both to the city and to them based on their site design. It could also be beneficial to MnDOT, who doesn't like to have individual driveways out onto Highway 57. And so if we can move traffic to the north onto that street rather than onto Highway 57, there's all kinds of benefits that can play into there. And maybe there's some funding associated with that as well. So, so the question becomes platting um, of that property. Can you work with the school district to uh, do a platting process for it? So those are some unknowns. I don't really know where they're at with how they're splitting it off and, and combining it. It could be as simple as doing an administrative lot combination where they're just adjusting boundaries if they've already split it off. Um, either way, we need to do the comp plan amendment. We also need to do the rezoning. Uh, and then we need to, um, of course, finish the annexation. And then there will be some site plan review that we have to do as well. And I think we would take all of those things concurrently together uh, as we walk through this. Moving that street to the north is what we've got illustrated here. Yeah. It is my understanding from Brandon is that the school has already applied to MnDOT for an access to 57. Probably. And so that that's where things now start to get muddy because if they're granted the access, the likelihood of us getting an access as it's illustrated here is probably pretty small. With the exception that I would, I would just say that when a school district is operating, multiple access for a school site could be beneficial to them. So I think for them to figure that into their site design, it's a conversation with them. You know, especially if they're athletic fields. You know, you think about going to a, a tournament venue. This is a pretty big parcel of land. If they have athletic, athletic fields there, you know, parking lot B, parking lot A. <laughs> and you want to have multiple accesses points, otherwise you've got a major major challenge. So there's value in having multiple access. Is that Zed asking for the access? Because that's... No, Zed I think already has okay. an access to their one parcel. And... For um, that Homestead site? Yeah. Yep. Is, that, is, that where, is that where the uh, turn lane was coming in at? Oh, well, that didn't work. That's got an access point right here already. And their site design, I assume, would have an access point. They could potentially, you know, I'm just throwing it out there, they could potentially come to the east and go on the back side of the Catholic Church property and yeah, so connect Zed, with the school parking Zed, lot. That is getting a new access point. Yeah, that's so right. They're going to close this one down here yep. and have a new one here. So is, is that the one that's being applied for? Might be. <laughs> that, 
that's why it's so that's the, the actual property. school proper that's the school property at the right. moment so the, this is the piece that I understand annexing. that they're going to donate that they're that required. three acres so they might be donating it with an access <clears throat> Again, this is stuff that there's no application yet, although I expect to get one and expect to see it on your planning commission agenda next do, month. Do they so need to annex that parking lot in order to get water and sewer to their building? Well, the one question that we have that's outstanding is um, the whole annexation thing. With the orderly annexation agreement, uh, and Tim, correct me if I state this wrong, with the orderly annexation agreement, the way it's written, there are clauses in there that talks about uh, both the town and the city not wanting to do piecemeal annexation. And so when you look at this site, what's left to be annexed between the town and Highway 57 and here is basically all of this. So they're going to annex this piece and this little piece here. That leaves this. Why not just but annex but it all? Yeah. And be done do they it. need to access the parking lot? Can they, they do. Just, can, they oh, just we need. can they just annex the the three-acre parcel that they're building the building on and get access for city and water, city water and sewer? Do they have to access uh, annex the parking lot? Can that all stay part of the school school property? And I'm I'm trying to play devil's advocate here a little yeah. bit. That says they don't need to annex that. They can build everything they want. And yeah, I don't know the answer to that question without okay. yeah. without uh, investigating it further. Where's the gas line? The gas line is it runs right through the driveway through the cul-de-sac here. Yeah. Yep. Right through there. Which is with, with parking. Hindu. But there's then there a big uh, junction that's above ground out there. I think there is. So they'd have to rework that. Yeah. Didn't MinDot tell us when they were talking about, or Brandon tell us, MinDot said when they were talking about the roundabout at 16th that. You know, there was some talk about an entrance to the west into that property Cradle that's for property. sale, yeah. and they didn't like that. Yeah. They wanted it X amount, 100 feet north, before there was another entrance. So how are they getting access for the school? Well, it's quite a ways further north, is it not? No. Not from the Radel property. No. Right across this I mean, isn't that what they told us? Yeah. That's why they wanted everybody to come in from the backside yeah. of Toons and Foots and Cunningham's yeah. because they didn't want another entrance. That's right. They didn't even like the Catholic Church having the entrance. Yep. Yeah, I mean, they, that's Mindot's objective is to minimize access points on the 57. So. Um, well, to the larger point that Brad was making, though, I think you know, is, is I think the preference to, that I would have would be to annex that whole parcel. Yeah. Um, it's not going to have any tax implications. It really doesn't affect the school district negatively in any way, and it's a lot cleaner to just be done with that instead of you know bringing in piece by piece. That's back to his point also about pl platting out this property. You know, I mean, are yeah. we going to require that? I don't know. Yeah. What the planning commission is going to want to do that. And I don't know that we can require it. Um, that's sure. a, it's still a question in my mind, and to me, it's more of a conversation with the school district and but sitting down with them and walking. And you're talking them. to annex all the way up to that section oh, line yeah, where Wilcox. Yeah, Wilcox. Yeah, yeah. That'd be their orderly annexation edge, anyways. Yep, I agree. So we're going to get an application for Z School, and we're going to be. Um, required to respond in a timely manner to that. And so I think there's just some conversations we should have with the school district. I know you've already had conversations uh, with them, but I think it's just kind of refreshing those and talking about some of these broader issues with Cass and Meadows 7th and connections to that and future road connections on a bigger scale and making sure we all have a, a common agreement as best we can as uh, these projects come forward. So with that said, should we circle back to uh, Castle Meadow 7th? Yeah, I think that's appropriate. Is there any further discussion to be had on that, gentlemen? What leverage, if any, do we do? I agree with Tim. I would much like to see that whole thing platted. 
including the the trail connection that Brad was referencing earlier, getting that done on paper. If you, if you allow them to plat all that, what stops them from building it? And if they build it, now you don't have another access. So I think that's where... What, I guess, what, do you, what are you saying? Now? I'm saying if you allow them, to, if you understand platting the rest of it, now they can build it all and you've got that many more houses without another access. Well, Wait, but I mean, they come clarify. out through 20 seconds. Let's clarify what you meant by platting all of it. <laughs> Just getting, uh, well, I guess bringing it in and platting it that aligns with the GDP. But the future developments would be out thoughts. Yeah. So they're not yep. buildable until they're go through that process. It's already an out lot the way they're bringing it forward, isn't or, it? Or well, if not right now. We're, that, that, we're that was one, one of the requests. conditions of approval yeah. is that they do that northerly half. So they are plat. They would plat everything. Yeah. The northerly half would be an out lot. Out lot. Right. Suddenly half would be what they've got for their preliminary plat. Yeah. And I think they're amenable to that. I think adding that trail section out to the west is definitely something we'll have that, in the final yes, plat. Yes. Yeah. So you know, it's not going to require them to do a lot of adjustment for them just to add a trail corridor. Right. We have that, that as a condition. a lot of approval. orbit to the north or to the south and add it in the middle. So. Yeah. yeah. So the conditions of approval that we have in here basically are the, the primary ones that, one, the access issues be negotiated through a developer's agreement. And so that's 10th Avenue and the, the 22nd Street connection. Yeah. Two, um, that the northerly portion be platted as outlot. Either a outlot or two outlots, however they want to do it is fine with us. Mm -hmm. um, three is that trail connection that we talked about. And then the other one are, are basic, um, basic <coughs> the engineer's comments and public works comments. So those would be the conditions of approval of what they have in front of you. Okay. With, with those, thoughts? I'll make a motion to approve with that. We have a motion to approve with said conditions. Do we have a second? Which one are we approving? The rezone or the preliminary plat? Or oh, do we, need we make them both in so one So you can motion? make them both in one motion. That's fine. Okay. Was that the intent of your motion, Dwayne? Yes. I'll amend that to reflect that. With that said, we have a motion. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The rezone and the preliminary plan have been approved. Mr. Chair, this one, uh, because of the rezoning, um, there was a new law passed last year that requires us to post ordinances on the city website 10 days prior to the council meeting. And so this will not go to Wednesday's council meeting. This will go to the 24th. I think it's the 24th. Uh, trying to keep things consistent here. Are we completely done with the Z discussion before we open up a new topic? Was there anything more that needed to be stated there? Yeah, unless there's other questions. I mean, it's most okay. informational because we have yeah. actually got the application. Okay. Here. So yeah. I just wanted you to know, I mean, I'm hoping that they bring this forward, and, you know, because I think they want to start digging this fall for sure. So. It's good to bring it in, though, because it did tie into what we were talking about before. Did, so right. yeah. Well, and I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we always talk about completeness at this board, and we want to have that planned. Out yes. before we start yeah. adding little bits and pieces on. So and I think that's what Dwayne wanted to bring to a point was other accesses. We need something in the works. And, and this, this basically a... Brad, can you share that with Linda, that map? Yeah, I can. Is this basically a relocation of the facility operating in Byron and just bringing it over to Castle? That's my okay. understanding. That's yep. correct. Okay. So if we're done with Zen, we'll go on to our solar farm discussion. All right, solar farm, awesome. Very good. So this is informational, entirely informational. Uh, appreciate these, uh, the, the, the company bringing it forward. Um, as you are all aware, in this uh, county, we have a lot of solar projects that are coming online on a regular basis. Um, one of my concerns is that uh, very quickly the city will be thinned in, um, especially on the north side. We, we know that the county is contemplating a project on property that's already in city limits, and that's something I haven't seen the final application for. This is actually a property that's a little further to the north, so it's not directly going to affect us, but it's on the Sterling Larson property, which is uh, right up the, the dump road there. Um, and I don't know if you highlight that there, Brad. Thank you so much. Um, you can kind of see what uh, they're talking about. I think we do have a representative from the, the company here today, so if you'd like to just come up and uh, let us know who you are and, and uh, give us a little idea of what's going on here. Absolutely. I do have some handouts. That'd be great. Can pass them around, please? Thank you. 
one. Okay. Yeah, my name is Nate Bell. I'm with a company called McComas Energy. Um, I'll let that. Nate, if you pick that white thing up right in front of the podium, that's a camera. Oh, this way? Yeah. Yep. Pick it up and turn it around and it'll see your... You can pick it up and put it on top of the podium, on top of there, and it'll show... Yep. Ah, I need to... Uh, don't want to uh, damage this thing, though. You gotta pay for it if you break it. Yeah, that's how it works. It's like every time there's a new piece of technology, we gotta learn. Yep, that one gets your face too. There, so we're from pretty darn close to that one. Or yeah, I'm not sure what. I go walking up there all the time. Oh, you just want to do that. Yeah, and then show the document right there. And there's another one that's a little further north too. Yeah, yeah. straight north of this. Yep, yep. No, I know that works fine. That's my walk in the sun. I see what you're saying now. Where do you walk? Yeah, I walk from my house up to. Uh, uh, okay, basically the dump. Come back, or or come back? Oh, okay. Kind of nice in the south. That's further than the dump. Well, yeah. we, I had an interesting conversation today about that quarry too, so that'll be. Yeah. Did you? Yeah. With the city, with the county yeah. engineer? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. How much longer does it have to go? Yeah. Not very good. <laughs> yeah. No, we're all learning. I know. By the time oh, this is over. <laughs> <we're just laughs> I've been waiting 47 years already. Like so. If we can make the argument that it's a water retainage, you know, to help with flood mitigation. Yeah. Maybe All right. Go ahead. Thank All you, right. sir. Thank you. Well, yeah, thanks for uh, having me. <coughs> really just, you know, wanted to speak to you guys. Um, I've worked with the county uh, before. We actually installed the Zumbro Garden to the south, just directly on Jeff Oldley's property there in 2019. Um, and so when I brought this forward to them, they said, hey, why don't you talk to the city Cassin, um, and we agreed, you know, since we are neighbors and going to be, you know, eventually in your guys' um, jurisdiction. Um, so want to make sure that you guys have, you know, any opportunity to uh, provide some comments or, or just have a, you know, discussion on it. Um, so it is, as you can see in the map there, it's off of uh, 240th Avenue, uh, just north of the existing Zumbro Garden, mm -hmm. um, and across the street from the county landfill. Um, there's actually a strip of county uh, buffer zone, is what they call it, um, for the landfill uh, that we would also propose access to, uh, similar to what we got on the garden to the south. Over here, you can kind of see the, the location there, uh, the, gar the gar existing garden on the south. Um, is in regards to county landfill and some of the uh, parcels north of uh, the city. Uh, general schedule, uh, what we're planning. Um, uh, we would be doing a zoning uh, process prior to conditional use. Uh, we'd actually move this into the same zone as that county landfill buffer zone, um, and it would just be that eight acres or so uh, for the solar garden. Um, that would happen here, a uh, public hearing process, likely May or June, and then the conditional use per permit following after that. Um, yeah, happy to answer any questions. Uh, construction tentatively, you know, late this year um, after anything. Um, otherwise, you know, early next spring. Um, what's the, uh, I guess, what's the length of time that this would be in place? Yeah, uh, we, we have a contract with the landowner for an option to lease anywhere between 25 years and 35 years. So there is, um, the Excel program that we work within is 25 years long. So there's always, you know, that's a, a definite period. Uh, anything beyond that is, is a little bit more speculative where who knows um, what technology, whether or not it'll be competitive. Um, so there is opportunity for us to extend it another 10 years, um, but that's the, the duration length. You said it's uh, eight acres? Sorry, Brad. Go ahead. You said it's an eight acre for one megawatt? I've seen different numbers. Yeah, yep, yeah, and you'll even see the parcel to the south is about four, four and a half uh, total. This, the, the fenced area is probably about seven and a half. Um, you know, the tracker technology that we'd be using here would actually require a little bit more space, just further distance between panels um, than the fixed design does. Um, you can get trackers that would be closer to six acres in size if you tightened up the rows. 
Um, but you know, there's a there's a range. I'd say anywhere between five and eight acres is you know even ten if it's a some challenging designs. Yeah, I have one question. Have you ever s experienced or seen uh, solar farms be decommissioned or deactivated? Yeah, uh, I I have not uh, gone through that process myself. Um, Mark uh, at the county is the solid waste um, you know uh, management too. Uh, so they worked uh, heavily in the new uh, Dodge County ordinance, which we would have to follow. And there's actually a security that we would have to post then uh, for a minimum of $200,000. Um, so he's confident in that number today. Um, and, you know, hopefully that just gets better over time where 200000 is just, you know, being conservative. Um, but in any regard, that would be left there so that the county has to clean it up if in the event, we, you know, the project owner wasn't there at the end of the day. What's the lifespan of these panels? Yeah, uh, they are rated for up to 35, 40 years. Um, I, was, I was saying earlier, the contract is 25 years. So that's where we really expect, okay, it's going to be 25 years. There's always potential that once they're in the ground, they, they keep producing energy, they will degrade over time, um, but they'll still be uh, producing energy. Um, and all that capital cost is already spent. So the energy should be pretty cheap at that point in time, but um, it is 25 years from now, so it's hard to tell whether or not that'll be competitive. Um, but they'll still be generating electricity. Does the motorized tracking system emit any sound? Uh, no, it doesn't. Um, you know, if you're within the, the fence, you would hear uh, general humming, mainly from the uh, inverters. Yep, correct. And uh, but other than that, um, you know, once you're you know 25 feet away, um, there's really not going to be any noticeable noise. Is there any height difference between the uh, six panels and the tracking yeah. ones? Yeah, not not necessarily. They'll both reach, you know, I'd say up to, you know, nine feet high. Uh, the tracker will, you know, at times be much lower, about five feet. Um, but that just all depends on the time of day. Uh, the fix, those, the top is usually about nine, nine and a half feet. Um, so roughly about the same stature, just depending on, you know, what time of day it is. That 200,000 for, say, they went bad or you guys left and the county did have to clean that up. I mean, is that, how sure are you of the, the cost of decommissioning something like that in the cleanup? Yeah, yeah, we have gotten pricing today from our contractors at forty to $50,000. Now, I'd say the, the calculations, there are definitely, uh, you know, many schools of thought just because we are earlier in this stage. Um, so I believe the county's view is a more conservative one, which is, is totally fine because you're, you know, better safe than sorry in this point. We have seen um, contractors say that they could be decommissioning an existing system today for about forty, uh, forty-five thousand um, dollars, but that would vary, you know, depending on what recycling values you assume and, and things of that nature. Right. So. Which brings me to another point. As far as how do you guys, what's your uh, process on um, recycling this stuff? You know, yeah. Is, I mean, how do you take care of it? I mean. I know it's get, begin, I'm doing some reading and stuff on some of this, and it's uh, <clears throat> starting to become quite an issue as far as making sure that with the solar farms that the people that are building these also have a rock solid plan on what yeah. they're going to do with the material because some stuff isn't as recyclable as other. Are you guys working hand in hand with somebody that does take care of that? Yes, yeah. guaranteed. Yeah. Just, just a little niche onto that. Sure. What percentage of that panel is recyclable? Yeah, yeah, both good questions. Um, we do use a panel. There's, there's one that um, I'm gonna uh, butcher this, but uh, uses a smaller amount for just cadmium telluride in the manufacturing process. So there isn't any uh, any amounts above you know trace amounts um, in the panel that's out there. <coughs> there are panels that use ones that would have a higher amount of that um, toxic uh, waste factor in it. The panels that we would use would be, you know, generally 
or more recyclable. Okay. So it's really just going to be the silicon, uh, glass, you know, metal, um, and then the uh, racking, metal, um, and you know, wire. So you know, for the most part, the things that wouldn't necessarily be recyclable are going to be like the concrete pad for the interconnection. Um, but you know, that's a pretty typical um, you know aspect in any construction project now. So you know, I'd say the panels that we're using are definitely going to be the easier ones to recycle long term, um, whether it's today or 25 years from now, just because of that, uh, you know, non-hazardous waste aspect to it. Um, and everything else in, in the project itself would be, you know, generally recyclable. So um, that's where, you know, we feel confident just based on the products that we choose and we put out there that, you know, we can't can, can stick to that number and you know, eat it to the point that we would you know, do it at the end of the day versus letting that bond uh, pay out $200,000. So. Right, but that's a bond that you guys have though, right? It, Correct. It is a bond. Yep, yep, it would be a bond or, uh, you know, most, most jurisdictions, I, I can't quite remember Dodge if it's specifically a bond or you can pay cash too. That is always an option. Um, in some places, that's you know one or the other uh, is what you can do. You know, you hear horror stories with some of the solar farms that are being decommissioned. That you know they'll scrape off the stuff, throw it in a shipping container, and send it to India to yeah. dump yeah. in the ocean. <laughs> you know, that's basically what's becoming enlightened over the last year or two. That you know, where is this stuff going? And so one of the biggest things that and what I've been understanding is just to make sure that someone who's coming in and, and doing these solar farms is got a yep. rock solid plan for the recyclability of this time. Yep. And so that's where we, you know, we just want to make sure that oh, yeah. you know, yep. in questioning about that, make sure you have the bond and everything. You know, oh yeah, yep, 100 percent. We don't and want I, any loopholes. No, absolutely. <laughs> and I say, you know, this is a learning process for jurisdictions and developers through these last. Uh, you know, projects have been going up for probably five or so years now, um, and Dodge did do a moratorium where um, put a pause on everything, came out with a new ordinance, I want to say almost a year ago now, um, and I'd say it's, you know, a top-notch one where it does require, you know, a full-blown plan mm -hmm. and a pretty robust security that not only make sure you know what you're doing up front, but also you're putting money down um, to make sure that you know even the best actors need to have that to keep them honest. So right. you know, but, you know, because in all actuality with stuff like that, you know, we can enter into it as you know, two hundred thousand dollars is a drop in a bucket compared to all of a sudden you have a hazardous material that you know, yeah. two hundred thousand dollars really doesn't get that much anymore. Yeah. You know, and then no. so. You know, yeah, no, question it. no, and, and that's a great question because they aren't all created equal. Uh, there's definitely a difference in the two, um, so that's a, a good question to ask. We've got a question from a gentleman who's off site and he states there, what happens to the site if the landowner is no longer with us? I, I assume yep. your agreement goes. Yep, it'll go to you know his, uh, you know whoever inherited inherits the land or whoever sold the property, they become the new landlord have same terms as what we have today, same length, um, they get the same um, lease payments, all that. So um, it would roll over um, and yeah, that's a good question. The conditional use permit also runs with the property, not the owner. I just uh, had one, more, one or two more just real quick questions. Uh, why here is it because, I mean, you don't mention Excel, so you're going to work in Excel. It's because the sub's in town here, and you're going to be running in that way. Is that why it makes it convenient to have it here? Yeah, th there's a couple factors. Uh, the substation's number one. Um, that always has a threshold of how much capacity it can take on, just via the transformer at the substation and the minimum load that the community is using. Um, so here, the substation, um, there is ability to do, you know, at least one more. We can never really tell exactly how many are left until you reach that endpoint with Excel. It's a, it's a bit of a black box, um, but we do know that this one has a good interconnection. Um, the other factor is that uh, you want to be closer to a viable feeder um, with three-phase. So this does have three-phase power. It is a viable feeder where um, it can take the required amps 
um, at that feeder. Sometimes you would have to upgrade portions of the line. It would just add to the project cost, um, and that's on the project. Um, so we look for two, those two factors, um, and then you know we were during our land hunting um, for the initial project with Zumbro. We met Sterling, was also interested in a project. It was on a little bit of a later um, cycle, um, but still a viable project, and he's, he's excited about it. So um, you know we're looking. That just leads to my second question. That's sure. Good job. Yep. Uh, costs, I mean, and this is obviously, you don't have to share any personal details, but it's, I mean, a million dollars? <laughs> it, can, it can be. Um, we, we don't move forward with a project that would be a million dollars, um, but it could. Um, you know, a transformer uh, can, can be, you know, many millions, um, depending on how big you would have to install it. Um, so that's why once it hits the capacity that's at the substation itself, that's pretty much everybody else at this size of a project is just, we're not, you know, you're not going to pay for that. Um, it's just not going to work. Um, but it can range, you know, a viable situation could be, you know, in the 100,000 to, you know, a couple hundred. Um, so it's, it's something that it, it can go up fast. <laughs> and, and you definitely, that'll um, make a project infeasible uh, pretty much immediately. Yeah. Do you guys, uh, your company works a lot directly with Excel, or is it yeah. this territory that? Yeah, the the program that you're typically seeing, um, you know, in the in Byron, and you know, in this area as well, um, uh, in you know Dodge Center as well, um, that would be all the Excel um, for the most part. Um, that that's the main program, it's a community solar garden program. So we would find a, a willing landowner, uh, we think it's good on the line, we'd submit an interconnection application, we'd have to go through uh, permitting process, make sure it's a, a viable piece of land to put solar on. Um, Excel says, hey, you're good to go. We'd have to go find customers to sell the energy credits to. Um, we do provide them with a small um, savings uh, but that's part of the program as a community aspect. They'd have to either be within the county or in a budding county. So any uh, project here in Dodge County, you know, that energy savings is going to go to, um, you know, businesses or residents in the community or in a budding community. Right, it, it, which brings me to another point as far as, you know, you're producing this energy inside the city limits of Cass and we're not, we're not, yeah. we're, we're not XL. Yeah. You know, so is there any kind of discrepancy that you guys run into on that as far as producing the electricity, selling it back to them, selling it to Energy to yeah. Excel? Is there any benefit to cast? Yeah, and that's the unfortunate thing. Since you're your own utility, you know, you can't participate in this program. Not to say, we, you know, you could explore other solar options um, within the community and buy that uh, electricity because it, it can be, you know, fairly competitive at this point in time. Um, but in this particular program, we wouldn't be able to sell to anybody who isn't a uh, Excel customer. Mm -hmm. So pretty much takes up most of the city limits. Um, I think it just starts kind of right at the top there. Um, I'd have to look at a map. but Because I've seen some programs where certain areas there, you know, once you put in an established solar farm that there is a benefit to, to usually to residents that the farm is in. So that was an important question that I had. Yeah. Answer. So that's, yep. yeah. explain that. No, no. If, if uh, any Excel customer can get the credits um, either within the county or uh, outside. But the Excel, it does stop and start pretty abruptly. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, one person may be it and then the next person's in the city uh, municipality, so and quite protective of their territory. Yeah, yeah, and and that's part of it. You know, Excel is the uh, investor-owned utility, so they have this mandated from the state, whereas the city doesn't. Um, you know, have to participate in things like this. So that's the main program, though, that you're seeing. Uh, there are a few one-off um, in um, you know more cooperative or municipal utilities uh, that um, they'll procure. But they're you know, few and far between compared to this. Mm -hmm. um, they may do one project that's a little bit bigger in size um, every couple of years, but um, nothing you know, to the scale of, of this program. Um, 
but they could buy a bigger project. Um, and that's one thing you could see is just the larger, some of the larger developments happening in the future. We could just have Jared run a line out and tap into it. <laughs> well, I mean, we're going to do our own. <laughs> yeah. we're gonna go. so anyway, thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Let me know. You know, if there's any feedback, we'd start the county process. Um, feel free to you know join in on that, or otherwise, um, the information, the, the the contact info, that's actually for Dan Rogers, who's a partner at the company. Uh, he had another arrangement, so I'm his fill-in. But uh, my name's Nate. So you can always reference me in, in that contact oh, info and happy to circle back with any other questions you might have. Um, but yeah, thanks a lot for the time. Appreciate it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. I heard that sign. Yeah. Oh boy. Uh, uh, uh. Is there anything else we want to discuss this evening, sir? So I'm going to thank you very much, everybody, for your okay. comments and thank you for that. Uh, a lot of really good information. As Brad mentioned, so recommendations be brought to the City Council for the Smiley Moose um, at the meeting on the 10th on Wednesday, and then later this month we'll have the uh, plat, you know, uh, resolution for them for the preliminary plat. So. Wonderful. Thank you all. I'll adjourn the meeting. Thank you. Yep. Got it? Right? Okay. Okay.